everybody, I'm The Drink Pro. Today we're cupping some of the world's most expensive coffees. Hey everybody, Drink Pro Kyle here. Thank you all so much for joining me. Please continue liking, subscribing, sharing these videos with your friends, and everything you do to support the channel means the world to me. One of my patrons, one of my fans, one of my friends, Mike Halliday, has been very generous and provided me with samples of a series of fantastic coffees. I look forward to explaining a little bit more about them. But also, one of the things I'm gonna to do today is a proper cupping. Now, I kind of hinted at it using a French press in a previous video, but I haven't actually done a video on a cupping, which is sort of a classic method to distinguish different coffees from each other that's used throughout the coffee industry. When you do a cupping, what you're really trying to do is eliminate every variable possible. You wanna make sure that the only thing that you're tasting and distinguishing between is the actual coffee itself. And that's very difficult. You have factors such as the roast on coffee, factors such as the water, the amount added and the source, the alkaline versus acidity of the water. There's an entire rule book of how to cup properly, but I'm basically doing this as close as I can get to a professional cupping. I'm not going to go through the strenuous acts of getting proper cups and proper alkaline water and all the things. Although luckily our fridge water here happens to be alkaline. So that will help a little bit. Even if you can't follow the exact regulations of any governing body that you know makes sure coffee cupping is done the same way every time, at home, it's really about what you like and figuring out which coffees you prefer and in what circumstances. So you have to find a way to standardize for your own settings. Um, I've seen a couple people on YouTube do it with well water because that's their local water. That's always the water they're going to use. Now, today I've got five coffees in front of me. One of them, the one here on my right, is just the standard Walmart brand. What is it, eight o'clock? Yeah. It's essentially a control to compare against these incredibly interesting, differing, and sometimes very expensive coffees. So the first coffee I've got here is Panama Elida Green Tip Geisha. Now, I know that's kind of a mouthful, but this coffee was actually developed in Western Ethiopia, but it's designed really to help prevent blight that was going on in Latin America at the time. While this coffee was eventually moved to Panama, it started its life in Costa Rica, but then was picked up in Panama and sort of developed into this really interesting, powerful, valuable blend. Now, when it was first developed, it was selling for $21 a pound, which at the time was the highest price anyone had ever paid for a pound of coffee. Well, that value has gone significantly up. Part of the value in this coffee is the rarity. There's less than 900 cups of this coffee in terms of gram weight in the United States. It's incredibly rare and hard to get your hands on. I'm very, very glad that Mike sent this to me. Big shout out, Mike Halliday. I appreciate it, man. Um, the most recent auction of this coffee saw a pound sell for over $1,000. So it's a really generous and significant contribution to this tasting. I'm looking forward to trying it. One other thing that I forgot to add was the fact that these coffees have all actually been roasted by Mike. He has been doing his own amateur roasting at his house. He's showed a series of roasters to me. It's very cool. Um, but there's kind of an art to roasting coffee, specifically when you're trying to do a cupping, because number one, you do want them all roasted the same, but also you want to make sure they're roasted sort of in the right level. They don't want to be too baked. You don't want them to be sort of underdeveloped and grassy and can kind of acidic and almost sour. It's going to be kind of fun to see not only trying these interesting and rare coffees, but also getting a sense of Mike's roasting techniques, because I think every roaster kind of has their own idea of how they want coffee to taste. Um, just based on the different places I've tried coffees from. I've had coffees that were very similar in terms of origin and in terms of price point, but that had very different profiles. And I think some of that is due to the fact that, you know, different people want to roast to different levels. Now, the second coffee I have today is actually grown in California, which is relatively uncommon. People don't think of California as a coffee growing location. It's a fairly recent move to start growing coffee there. Um, Mike actually got this coffee. and It was one of the first that he tried roasting himself. And he really liked it. He said, I watched a couple of videos with him. He talks about uh, how balanced the flavors were and it really just seems like a wonderful all around great coffee. He compared it to a Buffalo Trace store pick, which I kind of liked. You know, it's something that you know is gonna be good and it might be a little variety here and there. It's not gonna blow your mind, but it's always gonna be good. And I like that, I think that's a good comparison. Now third, we've got a coffee coming from Yemen. And that's actually a pretty uncommon place to get coffee if you're just looking around at your local coffee shop. And part of the reason is because Yemen has had problems economically for a long time. It's been a war-torn country. It's been a rather isolated country, but they make some really wonderful coffees, specifically coffees that look back to the origin of coffee and how coffee quote unquote used to taste. 
This is in part because the original country that we think of for coffee, the place where coffee really began, is Ethiopia. And although Ethiopia still makes lots of coffee, they become very commercialized, they become very industrialized, and a lot of the varietals that are used in the coffee plants are no longer there. You can contrast this with Yemen, where Ethiopia first sort of dealt in selling coffees, and not just their beans, but their trees and their processes. So some of the original varietals of coffee in Ethiopia still exist in Yemen, in part because they haven't had the chance to really explode and grow the different varietals and, and develop economically. It's unfortunate for them, but it's fortunate for people who are able to take this look back in history almost. Luckily, there are places in the US where you can buy coffee from Yemen. I believe this distributor is through California, someone who has spent their, they were born in Yemen and spent their life in Yemen. Finally, we have Kopi Luwak. Now, this is a very well-known coffee. I, you probably have heard about it, even if you've never tried it. It's the infamous cat poop coffee. What that really is referring to is the process to get to these coffee beans. Coffee beans are actually surrounded by a fruit. And there is a cat, the Indonesian palm civet, which will eat the fruit and then poop out the beans. It's an odd process, but once those beans are harvested, you can clean them off, wash them down, roast them and develop a really unique, interesting coffee. Now the beans themselves are actually from the West Highlands of Indonesia. So it's kind of good to see they're using Indonesian cats to get Indonesian beans to make a very specific kind of flavor. I think that's kind of fun. Also, it's just a great novelty to try coffee that's been through the digestive system of another animal. That's just weird and kind of fun, but uh, we'll see how it is. I, and there were questions about the safety of that, about whether or not it's gross or not. But, you know, when you think about a lot of our food production, be it, you know, steak being dead flesh or milk being cow, cow udder juice, it doesn't seem that gross to me. It doesn't seem that weird. We eat a lot of weird stuff. Matter of fact, do not look up where natural food dyes come from because it's freaking disgusting. All right, that's been plenty of preamble. I'm done chatting about coffees. I'm done chatting about the history. I'm done chatting about whatever else I'm talking about. Let's make some coffee. But first I need to grind it. I have no idea how long this is gonna take. I will definitely cut some of this out. I'm sure this is not good television or internet video or whatever the fuck I'm making here. But wait, there's more. I'm amazed how slow this is. I think I'm gonna turn my camera off after this first one. You can see that the steam is starting to rise from the kettle. It means it is done. Now you should cup around 200 degrees Fahrenheit, which is gonna be very shortly after the kettle stops steaming. Um, you, if you can you still hear boiling, it's probably still too hot, but it should be very quickly from kettle being fully completed, boiling water down to 200, where you can begin pouring in the water. I wanna make a point also to say that the eight o'clock brand is not a Walmart brand. You can buy it at a lot of different stores. My apologies to the good people of eight o'clock coffee and to my girlfriend Yolanda, who does not want to insinuate that we regularly shop at Walmart. <laughs> now, once you poured the water on the coffee, you wanna give it about four minutes to sort of brew essentially. And as that's occurring, there's going to be a crust form on the top of the coffee. After four minutes, you're gonna use your spoon and break the crust and stir it around a little bit. Just out of frame, I've actually got my laptop and I pulled up a coffee tasting wheel, much like the bourbon wheel that I use all the time. A coffee wheel has similar notes, but there are some differences. Some things are in coffee that aren't in bourbon and vice versa. So it's really helpful to have something like that in front of you, I think at any point, no matter what you're doing. If you're doing a tasting, it's good to be reminded of what kinds of things you're looking for. Your memory is much better with association when it has the word already right in place. 
Um, I think some people feel like that's cheap or cheating or something stupid like that, but who really cares? This isn't a professional thing. I am the drink pro, but it's the drink pro who needs to be acting professional. You at home need to be doing what you can to find what you like. And I'm not acting very professional at the time anyway. All right, let's break some crust. Now, I started pouring right to left. Uh, I think I am gonna keep breaking the crust that way, but this is the cheap coffee, so we'll see how it goes. It does not smell good. Kopi. Oh, wow, that's crazy. That's very, like, nutty and bready. Oh, man. I'm excited to taste that. I'm going to spread these out a little bit, actually, because I think some of the notes are starting to get lost between them. All right, let's go to the Yemen coffee. Ooh, I love that citrusy note. All right, here's the California one. It definitely has a more neutral nose, I guess I would say. I can tell that there are some notes in there, but I believe it's one of the older coffees I've got in terms of how long it was produced. And even though Mike had them vacuum sealed, some of that might deteriorate. It's hard to say for sure, but it does smell like there was, uh, it was much more balanced in terms of being no specific note coming out and really speaking to me. All right, finally. Oh, wow. That is weird. It smells like blueberries. It's very fruity, like blueberries and lemons, maybe like a meringue. Whoa, I'm excited. Once you've gotten the coffee pushed away and kind of let it fall around the bottom, basically next you have to get the foam off the top just to make sure there aren't any particulates in the sips that you're taking. Now, once you have the foam skimmed off and you've got the grounds pushed down to the bottom, it's basically a waiting game on temperature. Uh, typically, you want the coffee to be a little bit cooler than most people might enjoy it just sipping it. And part of that's because at higher and lower temperatures, it becomes more difficult to taste. This is something you see with whiskey a lot. A lot of people like colder whiskey or whiskey on ice. And the, a lot of the professionals won't use anything like that because the temperature shift will reduce the amount of flavors you can pull out. There's also a concern about burning your palate. Uh, you don't want to be drinking coffee when it's too hot. Uh, it might, you know, affect your palate. A lot of these people are professionals. They might have really expensive, valuable palates if this is their career. So there's a lot of different elements to it. But basically, in my mind, get the coffee to a nice temperature where you really think you're going to pull all the flavors from, and then you can start the tasting process. Now, you want to have a cupping spoon. There's different kinds of spoons you can use. Usually, cupping spoons are more rounded and sort of bowl-like as opposed to your teaspoon or tablespoon, which, you know, using on a table, is going to be a lot less deep. A soup spoon is a good substitute. One other thing I'll add, I've heard a lot of comments about people talking about cupping coffee being kind of weaker than average. And I think some of that is uh, really about being able to pull out different notes. Sometimes when you have coffee that's stronger, other elements underneath it can be overwhelming. It's sort of like an overage whiskey. When there's too much woodiness in the whiskey, it overpowers other more delicate notes. So some things get lost if you have a stronger cup of coffee. And uh, it might be valuable, in fact, to have one that's not as, you know, not as strong as humanly possible. First, I'll start with the geisha. Oh man, that's very sweet. I almost get like a creaminess. It's very sweet and sugary. There's a little bit of breadiness near the finish, but right off the bat, it's sweet cream. That's really cool. Oh, and there's a little bit of baker's chocolate near the end. As it gets to the finish, you get that really dark, fine, powdery chocolate. But the first thing you taste, the first thing you taste with that geisha right out the gate is blueberries. A lot of fruit in there. Blueberry, raspberry, some cherry. I think I get some citrus as well. Ooh, there's like grapefruit in that. That's cool. Ooh, I get like um, like a rich tobacco. It's got a woodiness to it too. That's a, oh, that's an amazing pour. So this is the California coffee. Oh wow. 
That has a flavor I know by heart, but I can't place it. God, what is that? Oh, it's like, um, maybe like sweet peas? Yeah, that's got a real earthiness, an herbal earthy quality to it. There's like a sage quality to this too. Oh, that's cool. All right, let's go in with the Yemen coffee. This reminds me a little bit more of the California blend than the Geisha. I get some floral notes on that myself. Yeah, it's a little bit floral, maybe like a hibiscus, a little bit earthy. I almost get the note of like carrot. Like there is some vegetable quality in this that's uncommon from my experience in other coffee. Definitely a woodiness, sweetness. This one lives more in the earthy category too. The first one was way out there in fruit and sugar and sweetness. I think the coffee from Yemen was a little bit more floral, uh, but they're both pretty earthy. The second and the third one, the California coffee was probably more herbal in a traditional sense. All right, let's go for the famous Cori coffee. Infamous, maybe. Ooh. I think the fourth one is the nuttiest for sure. I just got like a hazelnut. I got a little bit of almond. There's more grain qualities also. I'm, it's almost bready. It's a real distinct like... Uh, It's like fresh baked bread. Ooh, I just got some lemongrass on that Kopi coffee too. That's cool. In some ways I get like hops, like you get from a IPA. There's a hint of that that sort of appears in the Kopi. Ooh, I got some grassy and some dill notes. I'm gonna bounce around a little bit. I'll just give you some notes as I see fit. Oh, going back to the California is really eye-opening. It's way more citrusy than I remember. I think that's a really important lesson that I just learned doing this cupping is I got so much more citrus coming back to the California uh, coffee after tasting a couple of others. If you bounce between them, the distinctions between the flavors and between the characteristics highlight the differences. And so you can actually do a deep dive by bouncing between the flavors, which is sort of unlike my experiences with whiskey, where I have a harder time doing a deep dive when I just concentrate what if I don't concentrate on just one flavor? This California also has this pecan and almond and walnut flavor. Very nutty, I like it. The citrus and the nuts have a really interesting differential that uh, shows up in this coffee. Oh, yes, the herbal notes really pop on that Yemeni. I knew my battery would die in the middle of this, so if the angle's a little different, sorry. Oh, God. Oh, fuck. Oh, man. <laughs> so I just realized I hadn't tried the eight o'clock coffee. Oh, for fuck's sake. No. Good Lord. So if you ever want to. <laughs> oh, God, it's so bad. Oh, it, oh, it's like vomit. It tastes like vomit in the back of my throat. Unacceptable. Eight o'clock. Get your shit together, eight o'clock. This fucking garbage coffee. <laughs> Fuck. Ah. Well, this really highlights why you pay so much money for these good coffees because, wow, that's bad. Going from these beautiful, unique, interesting, multifaceted coffees back to the eight o'clock, which is bitter, which has a vomit flavor, which has this just unpleasant medicinal uh, sourness, unacceptable. No wonder you need to put cream and sugar in that. You do not need cream and sugar in this geisha because it already tastes like literal sugar, literal cream. Great learning experience. Thanks, Mike, so much for helping me do this. Oh, oh, I want, oh. <laughs> That geisha coffee is everything I want in a coffee. It is so sweet. It has all these cool berry notes. It's got citrus. It's got raspberry, blueberry, blackberry. Oh my God. Oh, it's got, it's got tropical fruit too. I just got like a passion fruit note, like a papaya note. I think the video I watched with Mike um, talking about these different coffees, I think he said that 
this Geisha coffee was compared to a grape or a, a green Jolly Rancher. I can definitely see that. I don't really get the Jolly Rancher note because the candied sweetness doesn't show up as much for me. Uh, it's more of a creamy sweetness, but there's definitely a fruit note. There's definitely a berry note and I can see apple as well, I suppose. But for me, I get a lot more of that raspberry. The raspberry is really prominent. I think I'm running out of flavor notes, mostly because I'm feeling myself get kind of jacked up on caffeine. I'm very sensitive to coffee and caffeine, uh, much more sensitive than I am to alcohol. Uh, but I'm feeling a lot of things. My mind is racing and I'm blown away by how delicious these coffees are. I just want to remind myself once more how bad this eight o'clock was. So uh, this is for you guys. Oh. Oh, oh my God, I almost just threw up, literally. All right, thank you all so much for watching. I'm gonna go run a couple miles to get all this energy out of me, but this has been a blast. Uh, I hope to do this some more in the future. Thank you again for liking and subscribing. Um, keep letting me know what kinds of things you wanna see. I love trying new experiences. You know, the Drink Pro is, is mainly a whiskey channel, but I'm not at all afraid to try different liquors, to try different coffees, to try mixed drinks. I want to experience different kinds of drinks. The Drink Pro is not the Whiskey Pro, even though I very much enjoy whiskey. So let's keep finding cool things to try, and you all keep drinking like professionals. Cheers. Oh, it's so good.